I'm Dr. Rick Wilson from Rice University, and this is Polytrix. In 2002, the government of Kenya asked for bids to replace its outdated passport system. A French company bid 6 million euros to do the job, but the Kenyan government awarded the contract to a British corporation called Anglo Leasing Finance, which had bid 30 million euros. Well, Anglo Leasing immediately subcontracted the job to the French company for 6 million euros and pocketed the rest. It was suspected that much of the money went to corrupt politicians. Well, when trying to track down Anglo Leasing, it was discovered that the firm only existed as a post office box. Corruption or terrorism relies on laundering money. Typically, this means creating an anonymous shell corporation in which to hide the transfer of money. International laws are supposed to make it hard to create fake corporations, but to what degree do these laws succeed? Well, studying corruption is hard to do. The activity is illegal and no one wants to admit to it. But a clever field experiment by Michael Finley, Daniel Nielsen, and J.C. Sharman appearing in the American Journal of Political Science cast light on the compliance to international law with respect to shell corporations. In one experiment, emails were sent to 1,800 corporate service providers based in 177 different countries. These providers specialize in incorporation and charge a fee for doing so. As with all experiments, treatments were designed and then randomly assigned to the different corporate service providers. The first treatment was a simple email asking whether the company would confidentially incorporate the writer's business. The email originated from a country that's marked by very low corruption. The second treatment did exactly the same thing, but noted that international law placed limits on confidentiality. This had the effect of making certain that companies receiving the email knew about the international standards. The third treatment offered to pay a premium, which could be understood as a bribe, if the company would expedite confidential incorporation. The fourth treatment was similar to the control condition, but the email originated from a country marked by very high levels of corruption. Finally, the last treatment involved an email from a country identified as a key site for suicide terrorism, and while asking for confidential incorporation also noted that the inquiry was on behalf of a Muslim charity. Well, as you might notice, the emails are pretty much the same, but the source of the email is increasingly suspicious. The authors are interested in the response from the corporate service provider to the initial email. They account for four different types of responses. These include not responding to the email, responding but refusing the offer, responding but asking for additional information, including a notarized photo of the incorporating firm's owner, and finally, responding favorably to the request without asking any questions. Well, what did they find? Overall, the percentage of firms willing to look the other way was a little over 8%. They found that companies in noted tax haven countries were more likely to respond to the email than companies in either developing or developed countries. Surprisingly, though, those tax haven countries were more likely to request proper identification. Now, the authors note that this may be due to firms specializing in incorporating services in tax haven countries have more experience with individuals requesting secrecy. Well, the good news is that offering a bribe to expedite incorporation decreased in companies' willingness to do so. The same is true with emails from countries known as key sites for terrorism. In these instances, everyone was more cautious. None of the other treatments dampened the willingness of corporate service providers to move ahead with incorporating a possible shell company. The rate still hovered around 8%, pointing out that international law is hard to enforce. The study provides valuable picture into compliance rates using very imaginative social science methods. It's certainly worth a read.